On the fateful date of November 14, 1997, the vibrant life of 14-year-old Rena Verk met a heartbreaking and tragic end when a group of her peers lured her to a party. Ensnared by her peers under the guise of a party, little did she know that the festivity was a fabricated ruse concealing a sinister plot against her. As the night unfolded, her absence raised concern among her family, triggering an unsettling realization that she hadn't returned home and no one could account for her departure from the ill-fated gathering. They reported her missing, but initially, the police did little to locate her due to her history as a runaway and her past troublesome behaviors. Tragically, her lifeless body was eventually discovered, and the dark truth behind her death would be uncovered by the investigators. This is the tragic case of Rena Verk. Rena Verk was born on March 10, 1983, in Sarnich, a district municipality on Vancouver Island in British Columbia in Canada. She came from an extended family that traced its roots back to India. Rena's mother, Suman, hailed from an Indo-Canadian family, whereas her father, Manjeet, was an immigrant from India. Rena's parents underwent a conversion from Hinduism and started embracing the beliefs of Jehovah's Witnesses despite being in the Sarnich community, where Sikhism was prevalent among Indo-Canadians. Growing up, Rena grappled with the persistent awareness of her outsider status, yearning for acceptance from her peers. Unfortunately, she became a target of relentless bullying due to her unconventional appearance and ethnic background. In a predominantly white school, her non-mainstream looks, coupled with being overweight and having brown skin, set her apart. Adding to her challenges, Rena faced the weight of adhering to her parents' strict religious principles, a stark contrast to her peers who were beginning to explore newfound freedom from their parental control. Concerns heightened when her parents discovered the prolonged bullying she endured since she started school, and suspected that it might have taken a toll on her mental well-being and that she was slipping into depression because of it. In May 1994, the family relocated, and this led to Rena transferring from Burnside Elementary School. Her parents hoped this relocation would put an end to the persistent bullying, and initially, it seemed to be working. Rena's spirits had been lifted, and she even forged a new friendship that brought her considerable joy. However, the positive turn took a downturn when the newfound friends shunned her and distanced themselves, reigniting the cycle of bullying. In 1996, Rena graduated from elementary school and started attending Colquitt's Middle School, where she met a new set of friends she deemed as the cool kids. This group defied curfews, indulged in alcohol and smoked as well, embodying the freedom Rena yearned for, a liberation from her strict parents and their religious regulations. Despite feeling embraced by her new circle, her parents disapproved, triggering a surge in rebellious behavior. In this turbulent phase, Rena's father, Manjit, recalled imparting a scripture to his daughter saying, bad associations spoil useful habits. In 1996, at the age of 13, Rena received some advice from a friend suggesting a way to leave her home. The friend proposed that she could enter foster care by informing the police of alleged physical assault. Acting on this advice, Rena reported her parents for assault, but no charges were filed due to insufficient evidence. Consequently, she was temporarily removed from her family and resided with her grandparents, who believed her account. Taking a troubling turn, Rena falsely accused her father of sexual assault, causing significant trauma to him. In 1997, her father faced arrest on charges of sexually assaulting Rena, leading to his incarceration awaiting arraignment. Ultimately, her father's charges were dismissed when she confessed to fabricating the assault allegations. Expressing discomfort in her grandparents' home, Rena was now then relocated to the foster home where she wanted to go. There, she formed connections and began mimicking her newfound friends who often smoked, always discussed gangs, where she even falsely claimed to be affiliated with one. After a while, Rena realized that living in a foster home didn't meet her expectations as she still had responsibilities and a curfew, therefore she apologized to her parents and returned home. Later on, she decided to leave her parents' house again, opting to stay in a youth shelter before eventually being placed in government care. Over the following months, she found herself caught in a cycle, moving between her parents' home, foster care and youth shelters. 
This tumultuous relationship with her parents, social workers, and government officials portrayed the struggles of a bewildered teenager. Desiring acceptance and friendship, she viewed her strict religious upbringing and overprotective parents as uncool or culturally out of touch, and she seemed willing to go to great lengths to gain peer approval. Middle school marked the most confusing and emotionally draining period of her life. In his 2008 book, Rena, A Father's Story, Manjit Verk detailed the family's anguish in dealing with their daughter, expressing his belief that Rena manipulated social workers and family members alike. He lamented the lack of belief in their side of the story and the widespread acceptance of Rena's narratives. Yearning for acceptance from those who had previously rejected her, Rena eagerly sought their approval. The invitation to a party on November 14, 1997, likely stirred excitement in her as it presented an opportunity to socialize with the cool kids. The event took place during an overnight stay with her parents, initially behind a Saanich school but later relocated to the nearby Craigflower Bridge after police intervention. Unfortunately, the party did not unfold as Rena had envisioned. At 10.40pm, just 20 minutes before her curfew, she reached out to her parents, notifying them that she was on her way home. Sadly, this phone call marked the last communication Rena's parents would have with her. At the Craigflower Bridge, a group of teenagers were smoking marijuana and drinking alcohol. Suddenly, several girls affiliated with a gang called the Shoreline Six targeted Rena. They subjected her to a brutal assault, physically beating her, placing a lit cigarette on her forehead, and even attempting to set her hair on fire. The attack persisted until one of the girls intervened and ordered the others to stop. Witnesses noted that the assault seemed unprovoked. After the initial attack was halted, Rena tried to escape and head home, but two teenagers, 15-year-old Kelly Ellard and 16-year-old Warren Glowatsky, pursued her. They dragged Rena to the other side of the Craigflower Bridge, where the violent onslaught continued with punches and kicks. Tragically, they held her head underwater until she succumbed to her injuries. Following her death, they removed her sweater and shoes, rolling her lifeless body into the water. Growing increasingly concerned as Rena's curfew passed by without her return, her parents initially speculated that she might have stayed at her grandparents' house for the night, but she wasn't there. She wasn't at the group home as well. They contacted one of Rena's friends who revealed that she was still at the party when the friend left around 11pm. The next day, Rena's family reported her missing. However, the police response was slower due to her history as a runaway attributed to her past behaviour. Rumours about a severe beating and a body found in the nearby Gorge waterway circulated among the students at Colquitt's Middle School, attended by the teenagers involved. The members of the Shoreline Six group, aware of the situation, maintained a code of silence, vowing not to betray each other. Despite the prevalent rumours, an eyewitness eventually came forward to the police, stating that she had seen Kelly and Warren follow Rena after the beating. Surprisingly, a week passed before a police investigation was initiated after Rena was reported missing. Despite numerous witnesses and teachers hearing rumours about the incident, for some unknown reasons, none had reported the information to the police. Instead, it took a student coming forward as a witness to prompt police involvement. On November 21, 1997, Glowatsky and Ellard were arrested and charged with murder and aggravated assault. The members of the Shoreline Six faced aggravated assault charges, but their identities remained unknown and protected under Canada's Young Offenders Act. On November 22nd, a police helicopter flew over the Craigflower Bridge area, but no signs were observed until a ground search was conducted. The search revealed a body concealed in weeds, later identified as that of the missing teenager, Rena Verk. The forensic pathologist determined that drowning was the cause of death. Subsequent autopsy findings disclosed that Rena had sustained a significant injury, with head injuries severe enough to have been fatal even without drowning. At the time of her tragic demise, Rena was just 14 years old. In February 1998, the six girls involved in the initial attack on Rena were prosecuted in youth court, and as stated earlier, their identities remained shielded from the public. Three of the girls admitted guilt to the charge of assault causing bodily harm, while the other three underwent a trial and were subsequently convicted of the same offence. Sentences varied, ranging from a 60-day conditional sentence to one year in jail. As for Ellard and Glowatsky, who were charged with Rena's murder, 
they faced a different legal process. Despite their ages, they were tried in adult court due to the severe nature of the crime. Warren Glowatsky had experienced a challenging upbringing marked by the absence of his alcoholic mother for a significant part of his life. Around the time of Rena's murder, he had found himself residing at a friend's house following his father's departure from British Columbia to live in California without him. In April 1999, Glowatsky's trial commenced, and by June of the same year, he was found guilty of second-degree murder, resulting in a life sentence. As a minor at the time of the crime, he was eligible for parole after serving seven years in prison. During his incarceration, Glowatsky discovered his Métis heritage, allowing him to involve tribal elders in his parole process. This process included various restorative justice measures involving meeting with Rena's family. In July 2006, he received unescorted temporary absences from jail and was ultimately released on full parole in June 2010. Rina's family did not oppose the parole request, as they believed Glowatsky demonstrated genuine remorse for his actions. In stark contrast, Kelly Ellard hailed from a more stable and traditional family that provided support during the trial. She was 15 years old at the time of Rina's murder. Despite her lawyer's request to have her case tried in youth court, the Supreme Court of Canada rejected this plea due to the level of violence involved in the crime and an apparent lack of remorse. Initially convicted of second-degree murder in March 2000, her conviction was overturned in January 2003 on grounds of an unfair trial. Released on bail while awaiting her appeal, Ellard had served 18 months of her life sentence. However, during this period of release pending a new trial, she faced charges of assault causing bodily harm for beating a 58-year-old woman in a Vancouver park. Her bail was revoked and she was returned to prison by March 2004. In June 2004, Kelly Ellard faced a new trial. Witnesses testified that she had bragged about being responsible for Rena's death. Glowatsky asserted that he had witnessed Ellard drowning Rena, but Ellard's lawyer questioned Glowatsky's credibility, highlighting alleged inconsistencies in his initial statements to the police and during the trial. Throughout her trial, Ellard admitted to assaulting Rena, claiming it was in defense of her friends as she thought that she was going to hurt them, however she vehemently denied committing murder. She shifted blame, asserting that Glowatsky and two other girls were the ones responsible for Rena's death. She expressed a resigned acceptance of an impending conviction, stating, I'm obviously going to be convicted. You've got what you want. My life is ruined. Ellard showed no remorse for her actions and failed to disclose the motive behind the planned attack. After deliberating for five days, the jury reached an impasse, leading to a mistrial declared by the judge in July 2004 due to a deadlock among the jurors. In February 2005, Kelly Ellard faced a new trial, with Glowatsky once again serving as the key witness. Glowatsky reiterated his testimony, affirming that he and Ellard had assaulted Rena, leaving her lifeless in the water. On April 12, 2005, Ellard was convicted for the second time of second-degree murder and received a life sentence with no chance of parole for seven years. However, in September 2008, the British Columbia Court of Appeal overturned Ellard's second-degree murder conviction, ordering a fourth trial on the grounds that the judge in her third trial had provided incorrect instructions to the jury regarding the testimony presented in the case. This legal saga finally concluded in June 2009 when the Supreme Court of Canada upheld her conviction for second-degree murder, putting an end to the prolonged legal proceedings. In 2017, Ellard was granted day parole, and by 2019, she received additional privileges such as overnight leaves and extended day parole. The Parole Board of Canada approved the continuation of Ellard's day parole. This decision drew significant media attention on July 14, 2020, as Ellard, who had initially received a life sentence, was now serving time on day parole. During her time on parole, Ellard changed her name to Kerry Sim, started a family with her spouse with the couple getting two children, and adhered to the conditions of her parole, including abstaining from alcohol and drugs and maintaining no contact with Rena's family. The lingering question all this time, however, revolved around the motive behind the teenagers deciding to beat up Rena and end up murdering her. One supposed reason was revenge. Rena had previously lived in a group home with two of the girls involved in the assault, who accused her of stealing her phone book and making calls while spreading rumors. 
Another girl claimed she harbored resentment towards Rena for allegedly stealing her boyfriend. In the year 2000, when Rena's parents initiated legal action against the teenagers involved, as well as the British Columbia government and other parties, Rena's father stated, Society doesn't make people take responsibility for their actions. This is one way to make them responsible. In 2012, Rena's mother addressed her daughter's tragic death and the detrimental impact of bullying on young individuals. She shared, For so long, we were consumed with the legalities of dealing with our murdered child, the courts prolonging the cases, and it's kind of like you put your feelings and your grief on hold. And I'm finding that now I'm feeling more of the impact of losing Rena, the emotions and feelings. So actually, I'm struggling more now and missing her more. I'm sad to say that the severity and the frequency of bullying are increasing instead of decreasing. And also, I think we're all shocked by the means that young people are using to bully their peers with cyberbullying and texting, all these things that were not there when Rena was killed. The tragic murder of Rena sparked a nationwide conversation on racism and bullying, particularly committed by young girls to other young girls they didn't like. In the aftermath of their daughter's death, Rena's parents sought to channel something positive from the tragedy. They initiated various anti-bullying campaigns and inclusion programs and actively advocated for the implementation of anti-bullying measures in British Columbia schools. Their outreach extended to speaking about bullying to students, teachers and law enforcement professionals. Through their persistent efforts, the government of British Columbia introduced an anti-bullying program in schools across the province. In recognition of their impactful advocacy, Rena's parents received a prestigious accolade in 2009. They were honored with the Anthony J. Hume Award of Distinction in British Columbia for their dedication to crime prevention and community safety efforts. It is sad and unfortunate what Rena Virk faced throughout her life up until her final moments. And while her actions were troublesome, it is somewhat understandable given the common teenage desire to try to fit in which can have both positive and negative consequences. Despite the challenges, her family continued to love her, even in the aftermath of false accusations and heinous deeds attributed to them. Their love for her remained unwavering, as they always wanted the best for her. Our deepest sympathies go out to the life that was lost too soon, and the grieving loved ones she left behind. If you found this video compelling, leave a like, comment your thoughts, and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you for watching.